Welcome to the Market Watch podcast by Amplify Live, where you can access the latest market insights with me, Anthony Chung, the head of market analysis, and joined by our head of trading, Piers Curran, getting you up to speed on what mattered in markets this week. Okay, it is Friday, the 16th of April, and it's the latest episode in the Market Watch series, episode 12. And we've decided to give Piers a day off. Um, but fear not, I am joined by a familiar face if you follow the Amplify Trader YouTube channel, Eddie Donmez. How's it going, Eddie? I am. How's it going? Glad to be uh, stepping in for the boss that is uh, <laughs> Piers Curran, but he's uh, slacking off on holiday. So happy to be here. Great stuff. And um, I hear it's been a busy week for you, you and the team. Yeah, definitely. So um, my role at Amplify is kind of the other side uh, of the business, so the dark side, uh, compared to Anthony's Amplify Live. So um, I'm the head of the Amplify Me division of, of Amplify, which is essentially the technology that drives all of the training behind uh, investment banks, um, so some of the programs that we run, and also uh, training students in various different front office roles in finance. So this week, uh, we've been super busy uh, running things like quantitative trading simulations, market making simulations, and uh, IPO simulations with uh, Citigroup. Uh, and last week, we were also working with uh, Credit Suisse on their, on their spring week. So we had a lot, lot of fun doing that. Okay, so I, I heard IPO simulation. So with that, we've got to talk about, of course, probably one of the biggest headline stories of the week, which is, of course, Coinbase. But one of the first things I wanted to just clear up, Eddie, and I hope you could explain it in a really uh, concise way, if possible, is this kind of confusion about, is this an IPO or is this a, a private listing? What's the difference here? Yeah, so it was actually a direct listing, contrary to uh, the financial media. Uh, so this is essentially where employees and investors sell their existing stock to the public. Um, and then in an IPO, they're essentially issuing shares for the first time. Uh, and another thing, uh, the, another difference between an IPO and a direct listing is that there's no underwriters. Um, so no one, uh, none of the investment banks are kind of involved in that underwriting process. So that's most likely why we saw so much volatility uh, on the first day of trading with Coinbase, because essentially the market makers set the price and they let it trade and passed it on to the secondary market. So you saw a massive ramp up to a peak of, I think, $430. Uh, and then all the way back down to $320 for, for Coinbase. Yeah, it was, it was so interesting. I was reading some stories at the time because obviously, you know, there's, there's a new type of market participant now, I think in 2021 with these more, the younger demographic and the access to, to trade these types of things. And I saw a stat that day traders purchased a net $57 million on its debut. Uh, the total accounted for 7% of the 822 million individual investors spent on all US stocks and ETFs on that day. And the stories were, there's a lot of, I think, um, new entrants to the market, let's say, who just all piled in the first 10 minutes and obviously when it turned. But I guess this is investing, right? There's, there's, there's intraday move, but then there's the overall investment uh, kind of horizon. And with that, I did see that Kathy Woods being very active over the last two days. So what's going on there? Because I know she's also a trending topic of late. Yeah, Kathy Woods, uh, obviously famous, particularly last year for just the outstanding performance of some of her innovation ETFs, uh, kind of new internet style uh, genomics, for example. Um, but obviously a big determinant of that kind of demand was, or uh, demand for the ETF and the performance was Tesla, of course, big big holding of hers. And that's one name she actually sold uh, over the last week and quite a sizable chunk to buy uh, some Coinbase. Um, so Kathy Wood's top holdings, uh, which are quite interesting as we've had bank earnings come out as well, are digital wallets. Uh, and really she's a big investor of innovation and the kind of secular trends, uh, just like the internet was uh, for an outlook of you know, five, 10, 15 years. Um, so she actually bought some Coinbase, selling a bit of her Tesla, which was really interesting. Um, so she, you know, she's a big, big believer of this technology, and she's a big uh, ad advocate of Bitcoin as well. And she, I think she's got 
um, a price target of around, or an addition to the price of Bitcoin that is at around $60,000 today, with another $500,000 incremental onto that price. And her thesis, uh, in very basic terms, is really a story of institutional adoption. Uh, and I can kind of talk about what this means for Coinbase, but um, in terms of what we've seen, uh, you know, really with, with Tesla allocating a portion of their kind of treasury assets to, to Bitcoin, Michael Saylor, of course, uh, made that uh, particularly famous as well uh, over the last year, uh, kind of using that as a kind of hedge against monetary debasement um, and, you know, and inflation. In addition uh, to that treasury kind of allocation of 5% would add 500,000 to that Bitcoin price, which of course is a, a, is a big driver of Coinbase. And that sounds pretty, pretty tasty, um, but let's not forget, she was pretty much spot on with her Tesla price target, uh, which again, draw lots of eyeballs and lots of criticism uh, a few years ago when she set that out. So, so we shouldn't get particularly worried then about the, the kind of coming out of Tesla this is only what a partial position kind of switch to free up cash. Yeah. So <laughs> unlike any other portfolio manager, I think um, she actually sells the boring companies, you know, the, the, the Amazons, the apples, uh, and she's very opportunistic kind of dip buyer in some of those really uh, interesting names that she has a big, you know, belief in the secular trend. So things like genomics and, uh, you know, software as a service. So she'll actually sell some of her biggest holdings that, you know, will uh, basically grow about eight to 10% a year, you know, that boring, boring return uh, and allocate some to those kind of uh, companies and and, sec and sec secular trends that she think will five or 10 X uh, from here. And yeah, just on the, just to kind of wrap up this, this point, you mentioned briefly about some of the more traditional banks and how they've had their, well, we've seen we've seen corporate earnings obviously come out this week, kicking off with some of the big banks. So just briefly, um, we had pretty spectacular numbers on one side, but then perhaps beneath the bonnet, there's a few signs of struggle elsewhere. So can you explain that a little bit about how, how these banks have performed so far? Yeah, so last year um, in March, of course, the really dark days of March, banks really set aside something that's called kind of credit provisions. This is basically a pot of money that they put aside if things go bad and things being loans. If loans go sour, you know, individuals, so consumers, if, if uh, commercial entities kind of default on those loans, that's a pot of money that they put aside to, to basically buffer for that. Uh, and this is really to do with expected losses. So kind of modeling of this is a percentage of the loan book that we think will go bad or, or be spoiled uh, by COVID. And then there's obviously unexpected losses as well that can, can arise. Um, but what we saw from the, the big banks really blow out figures. But I think if you look under the bonnet, yeah, there are some kind of interesting things to just take note of. I think the, the big kind of headline figures were that um, you know, there was a release of credit provisions, particularly by, by those names like JP Morgan. Uh, that were basically overcapitalized. You know, we we had increased kind of fiscal and monetary easing, things like the CARES Act, and lots of relief on that side. Um, so, and there's a lot of forbearance going on. Um, so they were just releasing some of those credit reserves. Um, but I think the key thing to take note of is that loan demand kind of does remain challenged. Um, banks are competing for those loans, um, and if you actually take out uh, that credit provision, uh, JP Morgan, I think earnings would have been down actually uh, year on year. So yeah, interesting to see kind of the, the traditional kind of banking activity suffering. Uh, and then this kind of uh, is, is interesting when you look at something like Kathy Wood, you know, really going all in on things like digital wallets. So or originating from Square uh, and PayPal, and they're making a big bet uh, on cryptocurrency, obviously, but really that is a kind of uh, a retail branch in your pocket, right? And this is really what they're betting on. So definitely uh, something to take note of on bank earnings. But on the other side, of course, you've got the investment bank performance, which has been amazing. But, you know, with Goldman, JP, for example, it's something you come to expect, right? They are investment banking powerhouses, trading volatility uh, has been there. And they've, I think, JP Morgan's uh, 
equity trading was at 47%. So they have smashed it out of the park. Of course, uh, it, it's, mu it's much of the same story we saw last year. So we had the volatility. So trading was up and lots of clients wanting to get in and out of positions. After that, uncertainty really in March and April with deal activity really grinding to a halt because, of course, corporations were holding on to their cash. No one really wanted to do it, that blockbuster acquisition. The VIX was, you know, elevated. So market conditions were extremely uh, kind of uh, really, really bad, <laughs> to put it lightly. Um, so no one wanted to IPO, for example. Uh, and then when that kind of uncertainty kind of subsided, there was lots of capital market activity. So what that means is companies looking to raise liquidity, so funds through the equity capital markets and debt capital markets. Then there were some dislocations in pricing. So of course, M&A activity came back. Lots of deals were put on ice. So that kind of came soaring back. So the investment banks, of course, killing it. Um, but again, it's that, it's that traditional banking activity. And we really saw that divergence between the JP Morgans and the uh, and the traditional investment banks versus the, the kind of retail specific, like Wells, for example. Yeah, I mean, the, the, from a trading perspective, given that's where I'm spending a lot of my time with the, with the guys, and, and certainly they're looking intraday. It's so interesting when you when you see these bank earnings come out and you see these blowout numbers and, and the stock price falls. I always think that earnings are, are a tricky um, news catalyst to trade often, unless you have that underlying awareness of all the kind of minute detail of how these different banks, these institutions uh, differ slightly and also context. I was looking at the beginning of the week, financials are up like 15% as a sector for Q1. So this is already priced in, right? These, these numbers. Because I, I saw, uh, if you remember on the YouTube channel, uh, and if you haven't watched that video, go and check it out. I was very bullish on the banks. Mm. Um, but I think it's been such a great ride, I think over the last six months, I think JP is up 68%. So really right. it was since the November election um, where that kind of uncertainty subsided. Of course, we had that inflationary fears. And of course, that's a steepening of the yield curve. So positive generally mm. for net interest margins and things like that. Uh, and of course, the big driver, of course, vaccines, right? So um, that's where we saw that bump. But I think it is a bit of profit taking uh, from there um, running into earnings. Okay, cool. Well, look, let's, uh, let's talk about another subject. So it's a little bit off markets. But it's something that obviously strikes a chord with you and I, Eddie, because we are we are two of those people that people generally read about in the news at the moment that have uh, made an exodus away from a major city, and we we've, we've decided we've opted to move out of London. Um, and yeah, we're going to talk about the UK housing market because I think people generally have always had a great interest in this, and I think that's probably born out of the fact that it's one of the biggest commitments that someone makes in in their life and so therefore it, it of course is going to resonate from an emotional perspective given the the risks that are surrounding with it you know and so this week we've had uk house prices hit record highs again the average price of uk home has jumped to a record 254,000 london it's now north of 505,000 but as ever the media love to call a crash. And that is still at play a little bit because people talking about, well, are we going to have a housing market kind of wake up with a bit of a hangover when the extension on the, the stamp holiday ends? But what's your take on the situation as it stands at the moment, Eddie? Yeah. Um, so let's flash back all the way to March 2020 again when kind of COVID hit and the world was looking so dark and uncertain. I mean, you would have pardon the pun, bet your house, the pr property prices would have been lower a year on uh, a year on from that. But flash forward to today, and the, the UK housing market is hot. Okay, so why, why have they uh, increased so much during this pandemic? Surely it's harder to buy houses. And you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, people being laid off. Uh, and there's a, a, diff a number of different factors kind of at work here. I think the biggest driver for me um, is low rates. Right. We've had global central banks as a, as a result of COVID, but really a kind of a trend really since the financial crisis running to slash rates. And this keeps financial conditions easy. Mortgage rates have really hit all time lows. I think you can get a 30 year mortgage as low as 3%. I've seen 
And if you flash back, obviously, to the 2000s, that 9%, if you flash back even further to the kind of 90s, that goes into the kind of uh, double digit teens. Um, so it's extremely cheap to borrow, right? And that's, of course, going to be a big driver. Um, of course, we've also seen kind of government policy as well have a big impact on this. So uh, in March, early of uh, March 2021, uh, but of, of course, earlier than that as well, the Chancellor, of course, Rishi, extended the stamp duty holiday. Uh, and of course, we've got tons of buyers rushing to complete their transactions before that, uh, that deadline. And it's not, a, it's not a small saving. It's, it can be up to £15,000 on a, you know, a single transaction to get that saving. So of course, that's going to really um, kick people into action to get that completed. Um, there's been huge demand, of course, number of prospective buyers has increased 17% in Q1 by uh, 2021. That's via Hamptons uh, and 67% uh, of ha houses on the market in the UK are currently sold uh, subject to uh, conditions. And that's via right move. So huge demand and limited supply, really. Um, but I think another really kind of controversial trend, obviously, we were based in London, uh, right by the Bank of England. It's been pretty much dead. We've seen a bit more activity kind of uh, liven up more recently. Of course, I miss you. Uh, I miss meetings in person. Uh, but I think lots of city workers have really rushed to the suburbs, um, you know, running, uh, you know, trainings and uh, just working eight, 10, you know, sometimes 12 hours a day in a single box room in a central London apartment that you're renting for £2,000 a month doesn't really sound that attractive. And a spare bedroom that you can have a home office, home gym, a nice garden, you know, just outside of London, you can make it in 30 minutes to an hour. That sounds pretty good um, to most city workers right now, especially if you only have to be in, let's say, once a week, twice a week. Um, will that change as we see kind of London open up? You know, of course, we're big lovers of London. I think most people are. Uh, it hasn't been the same uh, since the kind of COVID period. But as kind of the vaccines roll out and lots of people are vaccinated, do uh, businesses go back to kind of working um, you know, in the office? Uh, is, that, is this kind of trend going to be reversed? I don't think so. I think we're going to settle a happy medium of kind of hybrid work. Um, where we're kind of in the office for you know team building and meetings and strategy, which I think is super effective. But for those kind of head down, get on with your work, I think you, you can't get much better than being at home, no commute, you know, uh, and just cracking on with it. So we're, we're definitely going to be in a period of transition and it's definitely going to be interesting to fall. But just one, I guess, one more point, will we see a crash after this kind of stamp duty ho holiday? Will, you know, will people that are rushing to complete these transactions and buy these, you know, sub suburban houses with gardens, will they have overpaid, right, uh, with so much competition for those listings, you know, in six months time when the world is a little bit more normal than we are right now, you know, will you be looking back thinking, did I overpay for that house, you know, we'll see, but I think there will be a cooling off of the housing market, of course, after that stamp duty, but uh, I think the demand will persist, uh, at least at a baseline level for the next kind of uh, 12 months, I would say. Yeah, and, and, and just to, to wrap that point, I, I must say, you know, I know Rishi's a big, a big fan listener of the podcast, and I've just got to just say, send my thanks to him uh, and the rest of the team, because I remember I, I actually pulled the trigger early. It's one, one of my bigger trades, I'd say, because mm -hmm. um, I actually put my house on the market in March, 2020, after the pandemic, right when the market hit its low at Don Bon on the 23rd. Um, I'd already committed, I think, mentally to moving anyway. Um, so I was already kind of like, right, I'm just gonna commute in, that's fine. I'll come in five days a week and commute. Um, so, but then obviously that, that news came out, I was already down the path of going through contracts and stuff like that when that news came out. So. Um, so yeah, thanks, Rishi. <laughs> so, you, so you almost timed the market better than Jay, Jay Powell on that. <laughs> well, yeah, I didn't, I didn't get the S&P or even better, the Russell, but I did get the housing market. But let's, let, let's not count our chickens yet, uh, as you say. But, um, but yeah, I, I do think the point's very interesting, though, in terms of, uh, I agree. I, I, I definitely think that, I think we were discussing this earlier in the week, that 
if this was like an isolated incident that only affected England, I don't think you'd get that commitment from a corporate level for to force change in the way of which employees and their working routines and, and the way that they function and the structure. So I think the fact that this is global and it's and it's persisted. If you remember, when we were back at the beginning, do you remember and people in April, May were talking about it, and, and then we got to the summer and things did feel normal, if you remember last summer. And it was like, oh, that's, that's, that wasn't that wasn't so bad. And then actually to get to where we were, do you remember in Christmas and the new year? I mean, you never could have foreseen that in the summer. Um, it seems uh, ridiculous now to think that, you know, of course that was going to happen. But And so I do think the prolonged nature of this has created, it's been long enough to, to create that change, I think, in, in the way in which people from a behavioral pattern and employers will have to um, now react to, it's almost like the power shift in a way to the employee <laughs> to a certain respect um, where they, they, they want, um, I, I saw in a post that you made about, you know, living in this small box studio apartment when you can get value proposition so much better and have a better work-life balance in that respect. And I, and I think the key point is if the productivity is there and the numbers are there and the performance is there from the worker, you know, who, who are employers to say any different? If we do get a bit of kind of Zoom fatigue and general work from home fatigue and uh, kind of productivity does drop off, then by all means, I think employers are going to really kind of crack down on that. And rightly so, right? If you're not producing at home, you should be in the office to kind of to, to be there and to, to be helped. And I do think, you know, it's such a double-edged sword because I think we know each other, we've known each other for years, you know, I, we know uh, Will and Piers and the, the rest of the team. But if you're a new employee being, you know, really joining the, the workforce, then I think you've really suffered because there's so many things you pick up and those kind of quick questions and quick chit chat uh, about the job or just general life uh, and that social element as well, I think. Um, is definitely lacking. So if you have been onboarded in that kind of COVID period, I bet you're, you know, you're dying to get back. And I think you probably missed out. Um, but for the kind of seasoned employees that have been with the company for you know, more than six months a year, I think it's been, it's been fine. Cool. All right. Well, look, let's, uh, let's wrap it up there. And thank you, Eddie, for, for taking some time out to, to talk to me today. And yeah, if there's um, any questions at all, feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, you can email us at info at amplifytrading.com. Don't forget, out, forget to check out the YouTube channel. Both Eddie and I put out content on a, on a regular basis every day and every week. Um, but yeah, that wraps it up. Episode 12 in the bank. And have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks, Ant. Thanks, guys. <laughs>